They bought him the king of dream. Just an earthly king. But the Lord Jesus Christ was heaven supreme. Sacrifice for sin and those calling on his name will have everlasting His precious blood paid the price of salvation's cause. His resurrection power assured we will With Him in heaven, our faith is not in vain. I found no fault in Him when the Lord was coming. Yet the rabbis was free, Jesus crucified. But then hell and the grave, the Savior overcame. Jesus is the risen Lord. Our faith is not in vain. For Jesus gave his life on a old rugged cross. His precious blood paid the price of salvation's cause. His resurrection power assured we will reign with Him in heaven. Our faith is not in vain. Jesus gave His life on that old rugged cross. His precious blood paid the price of salvation's cost. His resurrection power assured we. With him in heaven, our faith is not in vain. Our faith is not in vain. Our faith is not in vain.
you to join me in your New Testament, the Gospel of John, as we look at one of many passages of Scripture today that relate to Resurrection Sunday. Of course, every Sunday in a very real sense is Resurrection, but on Easter, we set aside this time as a, a special reminder, a special emphasis on the power of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so I've selected these 10 verses from John chapter 20, and I want to share just a few thoughts along the subject of the testimony of the empty tomb. If you have your Bibles, follow along in verse 1 of John 20. Now, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came early to the tomb while it was still dark and saw the stone already taken away from the tomb. So she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter and the other disciple went forth, and they were going to the tomb. The two were running together, and the other disciple ran ahead faster than Peter and came to the tomb first. And stooping and looking in, he saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. And so Simon Peter also came, following him, and entered the tomb. And he saw the linen wrappings lying there, and the face cloth, which had been on his head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. So the other disciple who had first come to the tomb then also entered, and he saw and he believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. So the disciples went away again to their own homes. I can't even begin to wonder the awe and the uncertainty that those who came to the tomb of the Lord Jesus must have felt on that first Easter morning. To come to the tomb with the expectation, not of finding it empty, but of finding a guard and of finding it a place where they would be limited in what they could do. But lo and behold, just as Jesus had said and just as the prophets of old had prophesied, we can see firsthand through the gospel account the reality of Jesus Christ and the truth of his resurrection. The tomb was empty. Now, it tells us here in this passage of Scripture that the disciples were confused. They did not yet fully comprehend what was going on with regard to the resurrection, even though Jesus had taught them. Now, they will come to remember these things later on. But as they peered in, they did not find a body. When they arrived, all they saw was the tomb had been opened, the stone had been rolled back, and uh, Peter and John, on this occasion, looked into the tomb, but there was nothing there except for the wrappings, the burial wrappings with, within which the Lord Jesus had been buried. 
Now, the empty tomb is a wonderful account, but it's more than just a story. It's something we really need to understand in our hearts and lives today. The empty tomb has a testimony. It speaks to us in our heart and life as well. And I want to share a couple of things with you about the testimony of the tomb how, and how it applies to our lives today. The first thing that obviously comes to my mind, and I'm sure to your, yours as well when we think of the empty tomb, is that God's grace is sufficient. Now, it's very interesting. If you look at the life of the Lord as recorded in the Gospels, in the Scriptures, we never find one account where Jesus uses the word grace. But it's interesting when we consider why that's the fact. And the truth is that Jesus never used the word grace because he is grace. He is grace personified. He's grace in the flesh. He is the one who has come to pay for our sin debts. And he is the one who exhibits the willingness to take our place on Calvary's cross. He is grace. There's no reason for him to talk about it because he is the personification of it. Now, it's important to remember some things about Jesus and his coming. Jesus didn't come simply to give us a better way to live life. He didn't come for the express purpose of just giving us some examples that if we would live by them, we'd be better people. Now, that may be true, and it is true, but that isn't the purpose of his coming. Jesus came for the express purpose of doing something for us that we can't do for ourselves. That is what Easter is about. That's what the empty tomb is all about. It is a reminder of God's abundant grace toward us. Now that word grace is simply a word that can be defined by the definition of unmerited favor. Grace is simply something that someone gives to us that we do not deserve. And so salvation is something that God gives to us, not because we're worthy of it, not because we deserve it, but because of God's eternal love for us in spite of the sin and separation that we have in our life. Another thing about grace we need to be reminded of is that you can't earn it. And if you're trying to earn your way to heaven, then you need to understand there's not one thing in the Easter account, in the resurrection account, to suggest in any way that you have to contribute something in order for you to be right with God. In fact, the tomb says just the opposite. The tomb is a reflection and a reminder to us that everything that Christ did for us is all sufficient for us. We can bring nothing to our salvation. We can take nothing from our salvation. It is a sufficient salvation given to us because of God's wonderful love for us. It's a free gift given to us that if we receive it, God wonderfully and he willingly gives it to us. And we need to be reminded of that. I like what the evangelist D.L. Moody said one time. He said, if men could work their way to heaven, they would turn it into hell by dragging and beginning to brag about everything that they did in order to get to heaven. And that's true. When we get to heaven, we can brag of nothing but the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Not our good deeds, our good efforts, or anything else. Because when we look at the testimony of the tomb, it is a reminder to us that God's grace, number one, is sufficient. Secondly, I would have you notice from this passage of scripture, as we look at the testimony of the tomb, is that God's victory is assured. Uh, in Romans chapter 40, in Romans chapter 4 and verse 25, the Bible says that Jesus Christ was delivered over because of our transgressions and was raised because of our justification. God's redemptive plan is complete in Christ. And the victory we have in Christ is assured. And when you look at the tomb and the reality that Christ is resurrected, it shows and demonstrates the power of God in resurrecting our Lord Jesus, but also the blessed hope that we have in the resurrection as well. Because the resurrection is the final victory for us as believers in Jesus Christ. Now listen, if Jesus was not bodily resurrected, then everything that the Bible says is a lie. 
And if Jesus was not bodily raised and resurrected, then everything that the scriptures teach is a lie. And everything that we believe in as believers in Christ, as Christians, is a lie. But in the resurrection is the complete hope, is the complete victory that is assured because of the completed work of Jesus Christ on Calvary and the victory of his resurrection on the third day. Pastor and author Warren Wiersbe writes, he says, a dead Savior cannot save anybody. And he's exactly right. He says, the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead is as much a part of the gospel message as his sacrificial death on the cross. The resurrection proves that Jesus Christ is what he claimed to be the very Son of God. We see in the resurrection the blessed hope that we have in Jesus Christ. Paul pronounces that in the book of Romans, chapter 14, verses 8 and 9. He says, for if we live, we live for the Lord. Or if we die, we die for the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord. For to this end, Christ died and lived again, that he might be Lord both of the dead and of the living. Now today, in the world in which we live, the greatest threat we have in many ways is fear. It's the fear of the unknown. We live in fearful times. We live in the most uncertain times right now, that more uncertain than at any other time in our lifetimes and beyond that. We're not sure what's going on. We're not sure when some things are going to become normal again. Uh, politicians like to talk about it because it gets them votes and position. Uh, journalists like to write about it because it gives them status in the journalistic community. But the truth is, we're not sure what's going on. But from a world standpoint, we've never been sure. Uh, there is uncertainty in life. Not one of us know of tomorrow. The Bible says don't boast about tomorrow. We're not sure it's even coming. It doesn't mean we don't plan and prepare and we don't anticipate it. But we understand the uncertainty that life brings. But God's promise in the resurrection is that we have hope, we have peace, we have joy, we live victorious, we have a confidence in that uh, reality of the resurrection of Jesus Christ that we cannot find anywhere else along the way. I like the old song, Victory in Jesus. Victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me, he bought me with his redeeming blood. Friend, that's good theology, and it's victorious living. And we can sing that song, not just in our head, but in our heart, knowing that God's victory is assured when we look at the empty tomb of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we see, number one, God's grace is sufficient. We see, number two, that God's victory is assured. But there's one other thing I would say to you about the empty tomb and its testimony to us today. Now, it may not be something you particularly have thought of, but it's a real important part, a very important part to our understanding of the empty tomb and the victory of that empty tomb of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's this, that God's message must be shared. In Matthew chapter 28 and verse 7, we have another gospel account from Matthew's perspective as the Holy Spirit led him. And in that account of the empty tomb, we find some women who came to the tomb. Because there were disciples who came at certain times. There were women. These women came at a certain time. And the Holy Spirit inspired Matthew to write about them. And they had an encounter in Matthew chapter 28 with an angel. And in Matthew chapter 28 and verse 7... The angel at the empty tomb of the Lord Jesus instructs the women to go quickly and tell the disciples that he has risen from the dead. Go quickly and tell. That's the message from the tomb. That's the message. You go quickly. He's risen from the dead. He's alive. The victory is assured. And we can live in the promise of that. Now, you need to go and tell someone else about that. That's the message that Jesus leaves 
with his disciples in Mark chapter 16 and verse 15, just before his ascension back to heaven. He says in Mark 16, 15, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Now that word preach means to herald. It means to share. It means to go and tell. Christianity is a go and tell faith. Uh, that's been the message. It was the message of Christ from his earliest teachings is to go and tell someone else what they have seen and what has happened in their life. What better way for us to lead someone to Jesus than to go and to tell them? And that's what we try to do in a lot of different ways. We want to go and tell. We do it through proclamation like this. We do it uh, through other evangelism means. But the most profitable way we will do it is for each of us individually to go and share the blessed hope that is ours as believers with someone who is not yet a believer. So the message and testimony of the tomb of the Lord Jesus Christ is that the message needs to be shared. Now I realize not everyone is called to be a preacher from a platform. Uh, that's very true. Not everyone is called to be a missionary, to go in the sense of going to a different country or to leave your home and to go somewhere else. However, in a very real sense, every believer is a missionary. You may stay in Laurel County. You may stay in your community, but you're as much a missionary to Jesus there as the person who surrenders to a call to go to Africa or to Europe or to Russia or other parts of the world. So a missionary is a missionary, and the empty tomb uh, it reminds us that our testimony is to share what Christ has done with us to other people. That is our assignment to go and tell. So God's message must be shared, and we're called to go and to share it. And that message is an Easter message. It's one of victory. It's one of blessed hope. It's one of assurance. It's one of good news that God waits to save you from your sins today if you will repent of your sins and you will turn to him and confess him as your personal Savior and your personal Lord. He wants to do that. That's all about uh, the empty tomb. That's what it's all about. That God's grace is sufficient to cover your sins, to cover any sins for any person who will receive it. So God's grace is sufficient. God's victory is assured if you're willing to receive that free gift into your heart and life. And then we want to share that message with you because we as believers had someone share that message with us. And now it's our privilege that we can share it with you. Let me say to you who are believers, share the good news with someone. Uh, I realize we don't ha have the ability to have face-to-face -face contact right now. But you can still share through your example, through a phone call, through a witness and a card. There are ways that you can share your faith because I am telling you there is a world full of lost people out here who are searching and looking. And many of them are searching and looking in the wrong places and following the wrong things. The Bible is very clear about what it takes for us to be right with God. What it takes for us to have sin forgiven and to know that we're going to heaven to be with him eternally. Paul writes in Romans chapter 10 and verse 9, and this, by the way, is the resurrection promise. He says that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe with your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. You will be saved. That's God's promise to you. And could I invite you to just where you're at right now, to take some time and spend it with God alone and consider your eternal destiny. And if you're not right with God, if you're not giving your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, that you would confess your sins before him, not before others. He said, we confess these things before the Lord. Oh, and by the way, everybody already knows you're a sinner. You don't have to tell them you're a sinner. I already know you're a sinner. Why? Because we're all sinners. Uh, some of us have understood that and we have turned our heart and our life to the Lord Jesus Christ and been saved. You today need to understand your sinful condition and that God cannot and will not receive you into his eternal heaven in that, in that sinful condition. Listen, 
the testimony of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ and the power of his resurrection help us to know without any doubt that God has a redemptive plan for us if we will call upon his son and turn and believe in faith and be saved. That's my call to you. The Lord Jesus was put to death on an old rugged cross. They placed him in a borrowed tomb. But on the third day, he was raised to new life. Sorrow became joy to the disciples. Weakness became strength to the disciples. Fear became boldness to those disciples. And that's what knowing Christ does for us. Even in uncertain times, we have the strength of knowing that our God is in control and that he has an eternal plan for us. I pray that you will take this testimony of the tomb that we looked at for a few minutes together and you'll apply it to your life so that it will be said of you that I'm a follower, I'm a believer of the Lord Jesus Christ. He indeed is the Savior and the Lord of my life. Join me in prayer. Father, I thank you for scriptures such as these, and I thank you, Lord, that we have an opportunity to share them together. We share, Father, in the blessed hope that your spirit will certainly lead persons who need to receive this message and that they will understand that need of salvation and that you'll convict them of the sin in their life. And they'll see the, the power of the empty tomb and how that they can have that blessed peace. They can have that assured victory. They can receive that sufficient grace. And Father, I pray that we've shared with them in a way that your spirit can lead. Thank you for the empty tomb. Thank you for the blessed hope that is ours that we can share it together. And I pray that in all things that are accomplished in these days, that you will receive all of the honor and the glory for it. I pray this in the blessed Redeemer's name. Amen.